band together as groups to advocate for each other. That's where our power is. To solidarity, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. One thing I think we can also do to support change is just being unapologetically ourselves. We don't react with outrage, and that's really a huge problem. Chef Melissa, we have three dinners with a wonderful group of API celebrities and activists, people who are allies as well. I have our dinner, yeah. so the fun table. Is that the rowdy table? You're a little crazy. <laughs> We have a lot of amazing other groups. Hassan Minaj, Chef Alvin, how do you want me to set you up? Social media maven. Proponent of Filipino food. And Michelle Kwan are also hosting other tables. Yeah, y'all. I've been told to come and cook. What's happening? We have, from the new Marvel film, action movie star Simu Lu. Ooh. The amazing actress Olivia Munn. No big deal. No, big, no deal. big deal. We've got Ali Favalo. We've got Asia Jackson. We've got allies like Brandon Flynn. Tina Tian makes me really nervous because she was Michelle Obama's chief of staff. And Sophia Bush. I loved growing up watching her on TV all the I time. I definitely had a crush on her. Amazing star, Ross Butler. I'm like super gay, but I'm gay for Ross Butler. Wow, we do. We're attracted to everyone at this table. Lisa oh Ling, PD Wong. The incredible, iconic Margaret Cho. And we also have Jason Lee from Jubilee. Jay Shetty, gymnast extraordinaire, Caitlin Ohashi. We have Amanda Wynn. She's Ooh. incredible. Yeah. As much as we want to highlight all of the issues that are facing our communities, tonight, you know what? I just want to have fun. Same here. We know how to stand by each other, and we know how to eat. Here, go ahead. Get to know our dinner. Oh! This tomahawk, American Wagyu. This is a dinosaur. It's going to be cooked over coal. You are going to be creating a masterpiece of a meal for us today. Yum. I got to let you finish cooking. I'll see All you in good. there, right, brother? Thank you. Thank you, man. Yay! Are you ready for it? Yes! I don't think the, uh, the eight chandeliers is excessive. <laughs> I am so good to party. meet you. We're all vaxxed and okay. ready to party, right? May I propose a toast? Sure. Yeah. To the AAPI Ooh. community, to great friends, allies, good food, and to the haters. May they fall under the strength of our love. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. And of course, to Lucia, our special guest. <laughs> Lucia! Cheers. 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 We're going to do three courses tonight. In those courses, I'll be briefly tell the, the, the story of my family. And I wanted you to eat, like, you know, food that I grew up with. Uh, my mom is from the north of Thailand, so we're going to do papaya salad. Excellent. Fantastic. Yes. And then uh, my dad is from Bangkok, so we're going to do a tom kha gai, which is a coconut chicken soup. So that'll be the first course. We have some kimchi beef dumplings. Ooh. I just wanted to do something homey and cozy. I know it's a little bit more Korean, and I'm Chinese. I hope um, I did honor to it. <laughs> but uh, it's served with a little black vinegar dipping sauce on the side. But dig on in here. This sauce is like my favorite. Mm. So good. This is kini lao. We did a sashimi style, which is fish marinated in vinegar and citrus. Sound familiar? Ceviche. Ceviche. So, because Spain took over the Philippines, they brought it to Peru, and Peru is known for creating this. But on paper, we were the first. Mmm, it is so good. I don't know if you guys know this, but ceviche actually originated in the Philippines. A lot that of people think it's Spain. <laughs> I have something else to pass around as well. One of these will take you on an adventure with Nicolas Cage, and you will save the Declaration <laughs> of Independence. <laughs> no, we have scrolls because I think fortune cookies would have been a little too on the nose. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> these have questions that we'll be answering through the dinner. It's not truth or dare or anything. <laughs> Don't you worry. Darn it. Feel it out. <laughs> no pressure. Feel it out. <laughs> What's an Asian stereotype that bothers you? <laughs> 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 We are not all bad drivers. <laughs> oh. I grew up in LA. I'm a good driver. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen Tokyo Drift? Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so the stereotype that yes. bothers me the most is the quiet one. Mm -hmm. I was a trial lawyer, so you know, this is like, so that that's the one that's, you know, you're supposed to be yeah. unassuming. Yeah. You know, Submissive. Don't, 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 don't rock the boat. Does the stereotype of being quiet fall under that larger umbrella of the model minority myth yeah. that yes. Asian yes. people are? Absolutely. Okay. It's like, it's sort of the box, and especially Asian women in that mm -hmm. box. Yeah. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why, Margaret, I gotta tell you, you were a revelation. Yeah. I've been a fan for years. 
but you were that break that mold, yes. you know, yeah, out absolutely. there, absolutely. loud and proud in that way. That was the stereotype you broke. Oh, thank yes. you. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. wonderful. Yeah, no, you mean, really. When people come up and they're like, but you speak English so well. Yeah. Uh -huh. Where are you yeah. really from? Yeah, yeah, where are you really from? I mean, my, 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 the stereotype that annoys me is that Asian men aren't sexy. Oh. I mean, you can like, check out my hubby. I, I, I mean, I mean, <laughs> hello. I, I think Asian definitely. men are totally sexy. I didn't always when I was growing up because I, I hated being Asian because mm -hmm. I grew up in a community where there yes. weren't very many Asians. There was even a boy in my high school, a Chinese boy, who asked me to prom. And I said no because I didn't want another reason for for kids to tease me, yeah. but I rejected him. Yes, yeah, sure. And it lived with me for so long because I felt bad. It was so selfish. Well, self-protecting, you know. I let yourself off the hook a little bit. That poor boy is probably still crying. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting too that yeah. Asian men are unsexy, but then the stereotype around Asian women it's are completely exotic, fetishizing them. Exotic, and, and fetishizing, yeah. totally. Two tropes for Asian women are like, Dragon lady. Dragon lady. And like yeah, lotus blossom. Worker. But when you put that stereotype with the gender lens, part of that is examining toxic masculinity within our own culture, right? Big time. That's such an important piece of the Asian masculinity conversation too, because a lot of Asian guys talk about how they're emasculated by media and like that's that's important. Like, yes, but like the fetishization of Asian women are two parts of the same coin. And the, and the shared problem of white supremacy, which is that we're, we haven't been the architects of our own narrative for so yes. long, right? So basically, all the media is telling us is what they think we are. And for Asian women, that's one thing, and for Asian men, that's another. Just dickless, undateable, uh, uh, undesirable, whatever have you. Is that why you have abs? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Joel Kim Booster, and I'm out here interviewing Asians and their allies. How do you guys know each other? We go way back. We uh, we went to high school together. We're engaged. We create content together. We're we... actually married. Yeah. <laughs> Best friends since like freshman year. We were previously involved in <laughs> entanglements. <laughs> we met in college in San Diego. Is she your first Asian or one of many? <laughs> <laughs> do you remember being taught about AAPI history in school? I think for like a day, maybe. No, definitely not. Do you know what this is? Is it like a cousin of a plum? It's called a jujube. Okay. Okay. Where are you from? Uh, I grew up in Southern California. Okay, but where are you really from? I'm from New York. Okay, but where is your like family from? Spain, Italy. From Russia. Russia, okay, finally, we got there. So what is an Asian stereotype that bothers you? We are all the same. People don't know that there are different shades of Asians, that our cultures actually are quite different. Asians are meant to be obedient and passive. I would say about parents' expectations, like you gotta get all A's. That I should be really good at math. And you're not, you're not good at math. Uh, I dabble in math. You <laughs> dabble in math. Very submissive. Conservative. Is she? No, she's quite <laughs> dominant. And... In terms of Filipinos, that we're all nurses. <laughs> Driving, because Ashley's actually an excellent driver. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah, you are. Thank you so much. Wow, you're definitely getting lucky tonight. Um... <laughs> One that I find the most offensive for me is what we eat. The stereotype, like, do we eat? bats? Do we eat dogs? We want you to see us as human beings and not just the lotus blossom. The Asian guys have small willies. <laughs> <laughs> Best answer I've heard all day. And what is an Asian stereotype that you think your friend upholds? That she's sexy! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was a stereotype, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Do you have any thoughts about what's going on right now with the Asian American hate crimes that are happening in the country? People are like blaming the coronavirus on Asians and it's just not fair at all. My parents have been targeted. I was increasingly getting um, called the China virus. I did really fear for my life. So we gotta definitely look out for our Asian family and friends. How long have you been an Asian ally? I would say I've been an Asian ally my whole life, forever. As long as I can remember. We're going on 20 years now. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm a person of color, so you know I understand where Asian people have been messed with. So it just needs to stop. Making sure she is safe. Standing up for the people around you. Get to know them. Don't treat people with any hate. Just being more vocal. Not waiting 
for it to hit your backyard to now be concerned about it. Just using your platform, regardless of how big or how small. Definitely just listen. Listen and like amplify the voices that are already out there. We're all part of the same race, the human race. I yeah. think Ali has the next question. What does a true ally to the API community mean to you? And all heads what... turn. Yeah, right. Brandon. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what are our roles as allies to other marginalized communities? Yeah, That's thanks one. for being our ally tonight. Of course. <laughs> one, I'm <laughs> ju just the night. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what allyship has felt like looks a lot like yeah. exactly what we're doing at this mm -hmm. dinner table, mm -hmm. especially as a white man. I'm very much unchallenged because of that. To understand that the rest of my life has to look like me building relationships with people who don't look like me, who don't think like me, that to me is what allyship is. Oh, that gives me so yeah. much hope. Yeah. yeah, there is a lot of hope. A huge part of my platform is challenging colorism in Filipino communities because there are Filipinos who are not mixed with black that are darker than I am. <laughs> there are Filipinos that have hair that's curlier than mine, mm -hmm. but you're just not seeing it in media, so people just don't know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I always want to uplift um, the voices of black Asians because I feel like so often we are so like removed from the conversation of being mm -hmm. Asian and being mixed Asian because um, the conversation of mixed Asian tends to center on people who are mixed with white. So I really want to uplift black Asian voices. Asia is so huge and it's so diverse and it's just not portrayed that way in any type of media that we see, not even in Asia. So, right. you know, what more here? If we really look at roots of racism and white supremacy and cisgendered heteronormative patriarchy that has nothing for any of us, my fellow white people, it has nothing for us either. <laughs> watching at home, like, the, that's been built on the banding together, the, the homogeneity of whiteness. Yep. And the panic of really wealthy white people being like, we'll just take everybody who looks like us so we can remain in charge. Yes. I'm like, what? Yeah. I think it's really important that you're even talking about this idea of white supremacy, especially as a white person, because I know a lot of folks, when they hear that as a white person, you're afraid that we're talking about white people. Mm. And it's important to recognize that white supremacy is not that. It's yeah. actually that education, government, justice system was all built by, yeah. you know, history or decades of, you know, white patriarchy. Yeah. And we just have to re-examine why that's the case. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we're attacking white people, it's just why does the system exist this way? Why were we not taught these mm -hmm. things? It's not a white person's fault that that's the case. It might not be a conscious fault today, but if we don't advocate for right. change, yes. we if are- If you're allowed to continue to exist. Yeah, we're silently oppressing people. And when yes. you talk about the icons of your community, we ignore the achievements of so many communities to our own detriment because the history books were written by guys who looked like the founding fathers. That's yeah. the only reason. That's so good. We can, we can expand our purview. Just to bring it down to the present, there is a white supremacist ideology that is being yeah. pursued right That's now. Fair. Yeah. As we celebrate the increasing diversity of our country, API is the largest growing minority group in the country. We are going to be majority minority. Don't think people don't see that. Yeah. And that those who are currently in power, they are pursuing an agenda. It's a deliberate strategy, and this is where allyship needs to happen. We all who care about what the United States is and democracy is and representation is, we have got to fight this, like, right Amen. now. Man, I love that. And what people don't know is that that takes work. You put that work yeah. in because yes. you're constantly learning because you're confronted with the reality of diverse groups, whether it be with women or the vast, vast continent that is Asia. Yep. Mm. And when you're in a homogenous group, it's so easy just to nod and say like, sure, but it's mm. not challenging. And to constantly be challenged and challenge others is work. Yes. You're yeah, putting the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, man, cheers to the activists. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Dude, this is amazing. Wild, right? Street food. What's a piece of API history that impacted you? Do you remember learning any history in school about Asians? <laughs> Crickets. Mm. No. Huh. Well, yeah, the answer to the second part is like, no. Yeah. Did anybody? Elementary school, middle uh, school, high school, no, never. None. We didn't learn <laughs> any, no, any Even API Asians history. didn't learn about it. No, because history is always told through the eyes of the victors, right? right? Yeah. When you have no framework for the contributions that Asians have played in this country, right. right? The egregious discrimination that Asians have dealt with, like, it's so easy to overlook a whole 
demographic, right? And even dehumanize. Yeah. Probably learned about Japanese internment, I have to say. That actually, you know, yes. Probably, but it's like one picture and a caption. Yeah, it's right? like a subgenre of World <laughs> in War World, II. In World in World War yeah, II. Yeah, yeah. With the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, right? So you had, you know, over a hundred thousand American families that were forcibly displaced from their homes because of the ethnicity. You really start to realize, like, we have a perpetual foreigner thing that's attached to us. We could have been in this country for 150 years, and somebody will take one look at your face and be like, you're not from around here, go back to where you came from. I and still that, get that, it. Yeah. Right? That was true in the 1940s, that was true in the 1880s. True now. And that's true now with COVID, where somebody can look at you and be like, you gave me COVID. You know, what piece of AAPI history do I really remember and affected me was Vincent Chin's murder. So 1982. You know, there was no Pan-Asian movement. There was no AAPI that terminology. My parents came here after World War II, so the notion of allying with Japanese Americans mm. was like really not a thing. Mm. No, right, you know, because oh. they had lived under the Japanese occupation. Imagine how racist somewhere has to be where you already have countries who have millennia of racism against each other, banding together to fight new racists. Really, wow. it was Vincent Chin's murder, I think, that yes. really made everybody wake up because he was Chinese, mm. but was killed because they thought he was Japanese. Right. You know, by auto workers auto who workers. thought that, you know, the Japanese were taking their jobs, so they were gonna take it out on this young Chinese American man about to get married. And the right? fact that we don't learn that in school honestly mm -hmm. like astounds me. The API piece of history that completely changed my perspective on everything was when I learned about the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1800s. And I remember growing up and hearing, oh, Asian Americans have been in this country forever. But I was like, why is all of our stories similar? Like, oh, my mom and dad came in the 70s. Your dad came in 87. I ended up learning that Asian Americans came here. Then a piece of legislation was passed where they were just banned. Immigration stopped. And then the Immigration Act of 65 was passed, which came on the heels of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A lot of our parents came in that era. And I think about how powerful a piece of legislation that can be either hateful or really optimistic and powerful. And it's why like our story is so similar when you're telling stories about your mom, stories about my mom and my dad, they're all the same because they came to this country at the same time. The American dream looked a certain way. And um, it really hit me like, wow, like we, we have such a, a deep history in this country. My first Asian American course was at Penn when I was in college and I, Literally, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I took it only because my friend said, this is the easiest course, so definitely get an A. <laughs> so, but when I went to the court, I was blown away when I learned about Vincent Chan. I was blown away. I heard about, you know, the first Filipinos in America were in the 1500s. Yeah. So the first Asians in America came before even, like, the pilgrims came. Each person on this table is writing a part of API history right now, like, in this, in this space. And that narrative, that story needs to be told and shared together, and I think, that's what's been missing so far, is that there's all these groups in silos fighting for their own, and we don't want someone to feel unheard again. We don't want someone else to have to suffer in silence again, and that's only going to change if we stick together. It's such a disgrace that like, we don't know some of those names because we don't know where we come from. We've got this legacy of Vincent Chin, Yuri Kochiyama, right. you know, Grace Lee Boggs, Patsy Minx. So we actually have a huge legacy of like legendary kind of activists. I think that's what's really exciting about what's happening now, is I think that people are remembering that and recognizing that we stand on the shoulders of these giants. Our culture has always been heavily predicated on sharing food around a dinner table. And speaking of food, people love saying America is a melting pot, but honestly, let's take a look at that. I mean, to me, a melting pot is taking all of the ingredients, throwing them into a blender, and turning it on high until smooth. But I think that at its best, America's like shabu shabu, Japanese hot pot. Shabu shabu is named after the swishing sound of ingredients being swirled in a heated broth to cook. As the different ingredients move about each other, they imbue their own unique flavors into a stock. I know, my mouth is already watering. Just like food, the best friendships are also when two people are better together than when they're apart, like Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X. Yuri Kochiyama lived an idyllic life raised in San Pedro, California. After the events of Pearl Harbor in 1941, Yuri and her family were forced into an internment camp for three years. She left with nothing and nowhere to return to, so her family moved to New York into public housing where they integrated with black and brown communities. Yuri first met Malcolm X in 1963 at a protest against the arrest of 600 minority construction workers in Brooklyn. And that meeting was the start of a brief but tight friendship. 
It set the blueprint on allyship, coalition building, and activism across marginalized communities that we see today. Kochiyama was actually present when Malcolm X was shot. She held him and pleaded for him to stay alive. After Malcolm X's assassination, his social and civic blueprint combined with the injustices that Yuri faced fueled Kochiyama to commit her life to activism. Kochiyama fought for reparations and a government apology for the incarceration of Japanese Americans, and she got them to pay up. But she didn't stop there. She used this win to advocate for reparations for African Americans. She later fought against the Vietnam War and for the voices of Muslim, Middle Eastern, and South Asian peoples post 9-11. In a melting pot, inevitably the majority flavor takes over. Everything else kind of gets lost in the sauce. But in Shabu Shabu, if you close your eyes, you can taste everything in one perfect swish. Yuri, Malcolm, and the other activists weren't a melting pot. They were ingredients enriching each other, creating flavors together that they couldn't on their own, and working together to create a feast for all of America. Do you always have scrolls for your guys? Always. I just, I'm a big history buff, um, big pirate head, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask, obviously, this is a, we've been having a like, you know, really heavy conversation, and so I, I just want to ratchet up the stakes here a little bit. Whose food is better? Oh, man. Because oh. I, I love having arguments about Ooh. things that, 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 that matter, but also don't matter. So let's get into it. I know this is a moment of unity. You have to have eaten in the best place yes. to be able to fully have that debate. And are we talking oh, about like my mom's on, house? as an like, aggregate average, or like, do you want to start soups first? Because I know soups, <laughs> is, <laughs> soups is already oh, highly okay. contested. You have <laughs> you know? Vietnamese. I mean, that's yeah. yes. that. <laughs> yeah. And then in terms of just like liquids, like I'm talking about drinks, you had boba on one side, you had chai on one side. Boba. 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 I actually, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get called out for this, but I actually do think boba wins. Yes. I, think boba wins. I think in terms of just like what's on the main entree plate, mm -hmm. I think Desi Cuisine takes it. Yeah. If you look at the other cuisines, we basically have taken versions of it and then ramped it up in, in terms of like spiciness. We still got curry, so we can compete with Thai food. We have dal, so we can compete with pho, soup. Compete, but win? I don't know, that's, that's another. <laughs> yeah. oh. Our whole roster is very solid. When you look at the, the sheer size of a in, country in, in. like China, you have the North, you have the Sichuan, with Chengdu and the Sichuan peppercorns that numb your mouth. Ooh, yeah. Bro, that's just garai chicken. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, I don't even, duck is you duck and samosa. I see your dim sum and I raise you samosa. <laughs> How do y'all feel about my overall assessment? The three women were kind of like, okay. And you guys were like battling as if it was literally <laughs> like, as like we were playing FIFA right now. You guys well, were like, no, yeah, we'll no. It's about sports too. Okay, so what I'm getting out of this is that y'all will have us over for dinner. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you guys cook? Uh, my wife, I mean, my wife, <laughs> I, I saw Hassan Wait a minute, what is that? No, 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 no. I just yeah. saw Hassan I was, like, I was like, Olivia, was like, and then I was just like, I'm gonna pass it over to the monk. <laughs> Who's ready for the main entree? Ooh. Ooh. So here's our hot pot experience. Um, this is just something that's so close to home for me but it's a way to just bring the family to go. And I always kind of relate it to like Asian fondue. You know, there's yeah, a big right. pot in the middle of the spicy broth on one side. We have chicken broth on the other. All the raw ingredients around from clams to vegetables. But you just take pieces and dip them in the broth, let it cook. Just go in there, have fun. Oh, Get it in there. Oh man. Look at that. It is a Wagyu tomahawk steak and a calamansi demigloss, which is a traditional bistec, is what we call it in the Philippines. Pad Thai, right, most popular Thai dish. Millions of people have eaten this dish. So in the royal court style, we encased it in an egg crepe. Oh, oh. Right. So we did a banquet-style lobster here, so this is a cold-water lobster. But instead, uh, I did it in a Thai curry sauce. So I, I never want this night to food. end. Yeah, I, I know. Like this. Oh, this is great. All right, Asia, what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, when you were younger, was there a moment you didn't feel accepted? And what did it take to overcome that? How did you feel about this? You have a very unique childhood, I think. A very unique childhood. No, yes. I mean, you know, you you grew you up in 13 in front of, you know, the yeah, spotlight right. yeah. and kind of thrust into it. Yeah. You know, this was at the height of my career. I was 17 years old, going, you know, I was favorite to win Japan Nagano Olympics, representing the United States. And a reporter kept on asking me, You're so close to home. How does it feel? I'm like, 
I'm in Japan. I'm clearly wearing Team USA <laughs> uniform. I cannot be more. I'm, I'm, no I'm an American. Oh and so the competition wow. went on. I ended up second place. The headline the next day was American Beats Kwan. Mm. And when I saw that, I was like, wait, I don't get yeah, it. Yeah, Am yeah, I yeah. less American? I was like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, I was so proud to represent our country. Yeah. And I was truly living the American dream. And then to have that headline pop up, yeah. it's like, <gasps> it makes you question whether right. you really belong. When I had my first like adult job, where I was traveling all around the world and I loved it. And one year, Rolling Stone magazine, mm -hmm. they have this issue called the hot issue every year, like hot chef, mm -hmm. hot musician. And one year they named me hot reporter. Awesome. Yeah. You know, it was just like, it was the coolest thing that to ever happen to me. And a couple days later, I went to my mailbox in the office, and someone had cut out that article and drew slanted eyes over no my way. eyes. In your own office? In my own office, wow. and put it in my mailbox. And I took that, I took it out, I went back into my office, and I closed the door. And I realized, like, it could have been any person that I interacted with. It just took every ounce of pride that I had been feeling just away. It just, it, like, shattered me. Yeah. When I first did stand up, in the 80s, I didn't have a headshot, so I went to this like gig that I was supposed to perform at. They had taken a caricature of a Chinese railroad worker with a cue, the long oh, braid, no. eating rice with what? chopsticks. What? And it says, Margaret Cho, proof that the Chinese are funny. <gasps> and it was like, I mean, but it was from like the 1850s. Oh my really like from the Chinese oh Exclusion Act era. And it was so shocking. Well, and I'm sure they didn't even think it was racist, because that's the no. other thing that happens. Like, right. when you do that to an Asian, yes. it's sort of not racist. And here's what, why it links to the Asian hate, is that when you don't see somebody, mm -hmm. when you don't see their individuality, when what you see is just a caricature or it's just somebody else, then that's why you can throw a hammer at their head. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why yeah. you can take an older Asian woman and kick her down on the street. Yep. So they don't really understand. It's like the thing in Atlanta. Oh, that wasn't really a hate crime, yeah, right? Because they, we don't, they don't identify over. it because it's Asians. It is that dehumanizing yep. that allows then this, these physical acts of violence to take place because you wouldn't do it to another person you knew. Right. And we already often dehumanize the elderly. And so right, yeah. compiled with being a woman or being Asian or all three, that's why you see so many attacks happening on elder Asians older and many Asian, Asian women. women. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. don't react with outrage. And right. that's really a huge problem. All right. Good the sake? The yeah. sake. Yeah. 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 Okay, all so, right, so customarily, do we pour it for ourselves? Well, in Korean culture, right. the youngest person usually pours. So. Same with Chinese. I will take this note. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I know that's not me. Uh, so, so hard. I hate you. Right. Ross is doing it. I'll, I'll, I'll make a round. Is this, is, this, is this appropriate for you? You got to go um, this hand under the wrist or the elbow. Yeah. And then I will take it with both hands. Oh, yeah. Uh, so in the green uh, we also uh, receive uh, like the this, double I hand for and the double receiving is. Uh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Am I good enough to work at your restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to read my question real quick. All right, why do you think there is a mental health stigma and how can we break it? Oh. oh this is a good one for our community. You know, growing up for me, we never talked about mental health in our household. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a child of immigrants, I think you just hear like, toughen up, we'll get through it. We have this expectation of how we need to be successful mm -hmm. just purely yeah. based on our genetics. But when we don't live up to that standard, that leads to like a feeling of, I'm not as good as I should be and that's a depressing thought. Because <laughs> you weren't always uh, pursuing acting, right? No, I grew up in an academic, so I went to Ohio State for chemical engineering, and I did the whole thing, and then I dropped out, but I moved to LA and... <laughs> <laughs> to become an actor, then yeah. like, which... I'm grateful that I figured out early on that I don't need to pursue something that I'm not passionate about. Sure. So I think it's not a coincidence that in our community there's a lot of depression, right? Yeah. When you look at the stats, it's like, the general population in America seeks therapy and mental health counsel. About 20% of Americans will seek that. But when you look at the Asian American demographic, it's only 8.6% that actually seeks out mental health counsel because we're scared of how we're perceived. We're scared of how we're going to be seen as not having it all together. And that leads to that toxic masculinity point too. It's like we're trying to present ourselves as 
I figured it out because that's what we think we have yes, to do. Yes, yes. So much of that comes from our parents too, right? Like yeah, the savings, yeah. my parents were all about saving face. It was like, Always. clean up your house the moment those people come in and you present this image of like a picture perfect family with no yeah. problems. And like, we've all been there the moment that door <laughs> closes. When you know, when you're like, your friend's about to leave and their parents have come to pick them up and you're like, don't go! <laughs> and your parents are like, come visit anytime. At least from my family. <laughs> You go see a therapist, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Something's happened. I mean, within our Asian American culture, it's stigmatized. Like, what do you mean mental health? What do you What's mean What's wrong you with have you? Health? For immigrants, like for my mom, for example, there's this idea that like, we, you know, we don't have time to like mm -hmm. talk about mental health. Like we're trying to put food on the table. Yeah. Like right. you it's think- It's like a luxury for rich people. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. you think Survival. I have it, you think I have depression? Like I had to feed you guys, right. you know what I mean? Right. It's not installed in their idea of, of like the building blocks of healthy life. Therefore you can do all those other things. Mm -hmm. right? right. That's the way other people think of it. That's the way I think of it now. And, and that's too bad. It's, it's hard to kind of reverse that thinking. It's very cultural, though. You know, here we're not sought to seek treatment, to even share what's going on. Like, I think during the AIDS epidemic, a lot of Asian American men who had AIDS died because they were so afraid to seek treatment or figure wow. out what was going on. Yeah. Wow. And so in general, even though a lot of us are um, encouraged to go into the medical profession, we don't often seek medical treatment for things that we really need when it addresses yes. something that is shameful like sexuality or mental health. Why is it that our parents want us to all be doctors but they will not see a doctor yeah. themselves? Yeah. Exactly. Oh. It's not just exactly. mental health. It's just, my dad's like, yeah. no, I'm fine. I'm like, I don't think you're fine. No, no the yes. irony is it's I'm really in therapy intense. because of my parents. Yeah. <laughs> because of, right, and they're like, well, why, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Right? And they're surprising you. No, know, what's wrong, wrong with, with you? you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're wrong with me, and I'm here You're to try to undo all you. that now. <laughs> Therapy is such an amazing thing that people don't understand when, they, when they're not in it. Here we go. Yeah. Each of us at this table has a job worlds away from what our parents and grandparents ever could have imagined. What were your parents' expectations? So I would say I'm pretty fortunate in the sense of like having the backing from my parents to pursue an athletic career. It was so amazing, but sometimes even when I talk to them about like the wildest dreams that I have, they're still kind of like, <laughs> 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 okay, that's cute. <laughs> so what are you actually gonna do though? <laughs> it wasn't until like, oh my gosh, on my, my dad's side's family, when my mom was like, Caitlin's nine years old, she's a gymnast, she, really is talented, we're gonna move from Seattle to Missouri, Texas to pursue this elite career. They didn't talk to my mom for years. Wow. Yeah. My mom for the longest time was like, you can't be actor, only one man can do it, Tom Cruise. <laughs> I got that too. You did? Yes. That's so funny. My mom, who's always on my side, was just like, look, Hassan Beta, you're not Tom Cruise. <laughs> and that's the, so the funny. funny thing so to me funny. in my mind now is that that's the only person that like, yeah. Works in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Jet, how did your parents feel when, when yeah. you decided to pursue um, cooking? Asian parents do not want their kids to cook because they want their kids to become doctors, lawyers, they cook, and so Because they had to. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And they didn't want to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Figure skaters are pretty Doctor, awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, my parents were never happy that a you know I did poorly, very poorly in school. I dropped out of high school. And you know, Asian kids dropping out of high school and getting tattoos. Everything I was not supposed <laughs> wow. to do, I did. So you know, it was, it was a big struggle with my family for half of my life um, for acceptance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I moved to Portland. Yeah, sure. I left. I did not tell a soul. We have to run away from our family sometimes. Right. You know, especially if they're not supportive. Yeah. The most ironic thing that I find about all this is that many of our parents literally ran away from their homes. Yeah. 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 They yeah. took the biggest risk. Risk of their lives. For my parents, they had jobs in China. They were cushy. And they were like, you know, I just want to know what it's like out there. And that's why they... And but you know what it is? It's our job to show them what's possible. So I feel like our parents, they did their best to yes. prepare us for the yeah. world. But by the time we came of age to really live in this, the, the world had changed. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that you could have a book and a butcher shop yeah. and a restaurant, it's just, it was inconceivable. Right. But that's a good point because the specifically, yeah. it's not necessarily doctor or lawyer. I'm learning no. now. It's about, we came here to have a better life mm. and there's only 
five things you can do if you really want a better life. They did, you know, like your parents recognize your potential and like pushed you kind of to, to and kind of pour achieve. pour it all into their kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, and then I mean, there's love the in there pain, too. The struggle, there is the love. But for me, it has to do with them asserting a, yes. a, a role in our future. And in their culture, it was acceptable, right? Yes. Your parents can tell you what to do. Yes, it's, this right. a, it's an American way that where you can speak up and have a voice and have boundaries. Yeah. They paved all the roads for us, and it's our job to take them back to the front of those roads and walk them down and see what they have totally. created for us. Totally. They didn't discourage us because they didn't love us. They discouraged us because they wanted us to have a, a, a solid, future. How does intersectionality affect women, particularly Asian women? Whoa. Uh, wow, that's a good one. Chef, I want to know, sort of for you, <laughs> really, you're in a male-dominated profession. How, yeah. does, how does that? I'm in a male-dominated industry, and as a woman, there's already that challenge <laughs> that I face. But then also being, I'm a queer woman. So there's another layer to that. I'm a minority within the minority, within the minority of chefs. But certainly being a woman was really tough, yeah. But I think in like a male dominated industry for women to be there, it always, for me, it's always helped being in comedy because I'm a queer woman. Mm -hmm. And like the queer women succeed in comedy because we don't care what guys think. That's how it is in kitchens too. Oh yeah, in yeah. kitchens, the second, so I used to have really long hair, I was like more, feminine on the outward appearance. And I would get hit on left and right in the kitchen, yeah. you know, cat called. And then the second I cut my hair off or they find out that I'm gay, mm. all of a sudden I'm one of the boys. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, I'm part of the club. It's interesting how gendered our minds are. Mm -hmm. and, and when we're thinking about um, success and how male energy su supplies that idea of the archetype of who is successful. Mm -hmm. That is the intersectional challenge for women of color with all of the stereotypes that come with, whether you're black, Asian, Latinx, that gendered piece gets added on to that in ways, and, and then within your community. We do live at this piece where it's, people see my face first when I come in, but then they really very quickly get to my gender. But I suspect the Asian stuff comes second a little bit because that's still more of a curiosity, right? Um. Which is something that, I think our black brothers and sisters don't have, meaning, right. you know, we're kind of like a curiosity and we're a little bit maybe not as threatening. And what we then happens is we're invisible. When you put that stereotype with the gender lens, it becomes extremely violent, right? So what we're talking about in the model minority myth is that we'll put our heads down. Docile. We'll, yes, we'll be quiet. Mm -hmm. And subservient we, almost. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Asian women have one of the highest, if not the highest, rates of domestic violence in America. I'm reminded of all the times where people are like, of course you'll have higher rates of sexual violence. That's because you don't say no. Wow. I was in a domestic violence relationship in um, high school. And even when my parents found out, it was never like encouraged to say anything yeah. or speak out. And yeah. truthfully, this is like the first time I've ever said something out loud. I yeah. really relate. You know, when I went public with my rape, it was before Me Too. My parents did not understand. They were like, you know, what about your career? Why are you talking about this? We're asked all the time to just accept it. Yep. You know, you had to accept it, you had to accept it. And when you talk earlier, Simu, about like, how do men become better allies to women? It's, it's, it's first understanding that no one comes to our aid. Yeah. And, and the way that we're treated, the way that we are victimized is in a way that is very shameful to the rest of the world. It's always sexual. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not just by men, it's by other women who may not like the way that we look mm. because we have been coined as exotic. That seems like something that a white woman can't you know, attain. But I don't like being called exotic. I've been called exotic my whole life. We, I just want to just be. Be, be. exactly. Yeah. They're sexualizing you. Yes, mm -hmm. and they want to believe that I'm the dragon lady. Yeah. And that they want to call me outspoken. And I'm like, I'm not outspoken, I'm just speaking. There's a big difference. Yep. My mom is fully Filipina. Ever since the rise of violence on AAPI community members, my mom has asked me to go out and run her errands for her. She's been especially afraid to go to Asian markets by herself. 
Recently, more and more TV series and movies are featuring Asian American actors. However, many of the Asian actors tend to be half Asian. It upsets me because it seems like producers still want people who still look a little white. It's almost like they are averse to casting Asians who look undeniably Asian. Obviously, someone who is half Asian won't look like me, so I still don't feel represented. Being half white and half Korean, I've never felt Korean enough. When the Atlanta shootings happened, all my friends were checking in on my full Asian friends, but didn't address me in any way. I felt like I was not allowed to grieve because I'm not, quote, Asian enough, even though the women who were killed looked just like my mom. I wish I looked less Asian. When I look in the mirror, I see facial features that could be fixed with plastic surgery. My flat nose, slender eyes, round cheekbones, yellow skin. The Asian beauty standard seems to want nothing to do with these features, but it belongs to us, yet I still want them gone. Trust me, as somebody who embodies a lot of the typical Asian features, it took me a while to learn to love them, but I do love myself. You know, I, I just, I hope that you can get to that point because you are beautiful and I hope that you can realize that. Sometimes I wish I could find out more about my culture, but I'm never accepted into AAPI spaces because I'm not fully Asian. I'm scared that I won't be able to pass on my Chinese Indonesian heritage to my children. I can't speak the language, can't cook the food, and I've only met my grandparents and extended family three times in my entire life. I grew up in a very old-fashioned Chinese family. When I was 16, I had my first girlfriend, and she was black. When I told my parents that she wasn't Chinese, my mom and dad threatened to disown me if I didn't break up with her. She dumped me before I ever got the chance to even talk about it, and now I'm afraid to date anyone who is not Chinese. I tried killing myself when I was 16. I sat on the kitchen floor, sobbing with the razor blade in my hand. My family never knew. To this day, they think my scars were just clumsy accidents. I never told them because mental illness has always been a taboo in Asian households like my own. Wow. As a child, I refused to eat the Vietnamese food my mom cooked for me at school. I would starve myself during school lunches because the other kids in my class continuously bullied me for eating strange food. Ah, uh, this, this hits me. This is exactly how I felt when I was a kid. The type of food that you eat at home shows so much about who you are and where you come from. And it tells a lot of your, about your story. Be proud of that. Be proud of the food that you eat. Be proud of your culture. And yeah, you have the best lunchbox. So I'm jealous. <laughs> oh my god, this is my favorite. Look at it. Like oh, so nice. <laughs> For dessert, it's a very Thai classic dish of sticky rice with mangoes. So you take Thai sticky rice, you bathe it in coconut milk syrup, wow. the creaminess and the sweet. Um, should all play well with each Texture. other. Oh. Don't mind if I do. Oh, this is so good. Mm. <laughs> so dessert is my version of suman, similar to the tamale, mm. using sweet rice flour and coconut milk with fresh grated coconut and black sugar. Mm. Amazing. We have a Hong Kong milk tea tiramisu. On top has a little bit of milk chocolate, of Hong Kong milk tea custard with those traditional tiramisu cookies. It was inspired by my time in Italy, but wanting to pull in some of my heritage. Oh, yeah. Oh, that is so good. That's amazing. amazing. <laughs> oh, whoa. Oh, oh. <laughs> As a child, I culturally identified as blank because blank. Mm. I culturally identified as um, 100% Asian because I was raised by my mother's family. And my grandmother, wow. the day the war ended in Vietnam, they got onto a boat and then they uh, made their way to America. I, I didn't really even think that I was anything other than just being full Asian. And it's only when I first came to Hollywood when I started to be told like, and you're too white to be this, you're too Asian to be this. Wow. wow. Yeah. How many people had to go so much of their life trying to not be Asian just to fit in? and ignore that side of themselves. But for me, it's like something that I've always loved so much and embraced. Yeah. Right. As a child, I culturally identified as Korean, but I found out 10 years ago that I'm actually Chinese. Wow. So I did a wow. genealogy. Really? 100%. 100% Chinese. Wow. wow. No kidding. Whoa. And my parents were like, well, no. I'm 100% Chinese. Wow. Wow. So I love that. 
amazing. I love it too. I love Come it. Back. Come back. Come back. Yes. What about you, Alvin? What'd you identify? Oh my gosh. So I was born in LA. I grew up in Pico Rivera, which is a predominantly Mexican American neighborhood. So immediately I was called Chino, mm. which means Chinese. And I'm not even Chinese. Like I was just super confused. And then when I went to the culinary world and I had a chef who thought I was Mexican for three years. And then the chef goes, God damn, I didn't know you were a Filipino, dude. But that was the day I realized I needed to cook more Filipino food. And that's what changed everything. So Ali, everything. When, when you came to the mainland, mm. I mean, coming from like a totally homogenous environment, mm. what did you think about everything that was going on? I moved from Hawaii to New York, which was really incredible because I felt like it was a similar melting pot. Like, I, I met so many immigrants and so many mixed kids who also were in casting and they were like, oh, um, you're racially ambiguous. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> it was just hit me in my identity. <laughs> Ross, how would you answer this coming from a, a mixed background? Uh, so I, you know, if I wanted to ask a girl out on a date, I was like, how would Ryan Gosling do it? <laughs> oh, but uh, I'm Chinese Malaysian on my Asian half, and then British Irish on my white half. So I'm pretty much you two in one. <laughs> I always just consider myself American, and now we're at the point in American history where Asian American is becoming a, a pretty big population. So um, yeah, and, and you know the whole Asian part. It was like my mom is Asian and she would make Asian food, but she was also like pretty Americanized as well. But as an adult now, I identify as Asian American because you know, that is now a thing. And, and well, we claim you as well. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and are you Chinese or I... formerly Korean? <laughs> Artist formerly known as Korean. One of the things I've been thinking about for a lot of us in the community, you're goody two shoes, you keep your head down at Kumon, <laughs> and, and, and you keep it pushing. And I think COVID was one of those inflection point moments where a lot of folks started to turn up, speak out, and say, hey, like, I'm, I'm really proud of my heritage. For sure. Both being Asian and American. I always felt like I had a home jersey. But when I was 15, 9-11 happened my sophomore year, going to high school the next day. That was the first time I felt like I was wearing an away jersey. Wow. And when I see a lot of people in the Asian community right now, going through this next second wave of what I call America's war on terror. For a lot of people in the AAPI community where they're like, hey, grandma and grandpa, I don't want them to go walk to the store. Sure. Dad's going to Home Depot to get a big ass American flag. Like I'm seeing sophomore yeah. year happen over again in front of my eyes. It's wild. I was actually born in China and I didn't immigrate um, to Canada until I was five. So what I did effectively was wear an away jersey my whole life. And it wasn't until very recently that I've kind of learned how to swap that for a home jersey. So I feel like my journey has kind of been opposite in a lot of ways. My parents studied electrical engineering at Queen's University. They were like apex academics, you know? And um, so they left when, when I was about eight or nine months old. And I was raised by my grandparents and literally that's kind of how I lived life. And my grandparents were my parents. And then one day when I was Similar four and album, a half, right? yeah. yeah. Uh, one day my dad showed up at my door and he was a total stranger. And he was like, hey, I'm your dad. And uh, you're coming to Canada. And so at that point I had to like basically pack up my whole life. I had to say goodbye to the only parental figures that I knew and then head over to this strange new country with like absolutely no idea, by the way, how to speak English. Basically two days after landing, my parents had to drop me off at a daycare and I literally, like, I cried my eyes out the whole day because I didn't know what was being said to me. And I remember that was, you know, one of one of one Asian kids in my class. And so I was, I was like an outsider for as long as I could remember. And it wasn't until, you know, I feel like what was happening now with, with our movement and, and being involved with a show like Kim's Convenience that's such a celebration of, of Asian-ness um, that I that I really learned how to be Asian, how to be Asian American or Asian Canadian. That like that is that is something that you have to learn, though. It doesn't come naturally. Let's see here. How do you and your family express love towards each other? Mm. Oh my God. Well, this is the perfect question for me. <laughs> In my household, it was always food. Uh, I would say traditionally Asians don't talk about their feelings. We don't express. We don't say, I love you. We don't give our kids hugs. Mm. <laughs> but oftentimes, it was always through food. If I was sick, my mom would make rice kanji. Mm. And that was our chicken noodle soup. And we would go to dim sum every Sunday with grandma. 
but that was our way of coming together as a family. But yeah, I can't remember many moments of my life where even like I heard from my, specifically from my father, like, I'm proud of you. That was, that took many years until I went on Top Chef and one Top Chef. Only when, <laughs> Only when I went on one. television, yes. yeah. Wow. You have to be able to communicate and show your love. I was actually the first one in the family to say I love you. And I know, I, I heard that your husband, yeah. not until 28, right? My husband, who's Korean-American, no, his parents didn't tell him that they loved him until he was in his 40s. In 40s! Wow. Yeah. Well, my parents really warmed yeah. up somewhere in the 80s and 90s. At what point? What did it take? Like winning a Tony or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was the moment? The 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 no, no, it was before that. As they got older, my parents became much more demonstrative and the concept of saying I love you, hugging became very healthy. Yeah. That's great. You, you know what a distinction I always try to make now is, is separating love from, I guess, the expectation of achievement in many Asian households. It's mm. this sort of stereotype that Asian families are cold, especially East Asian families, like, are colder, achievement-oriented. And when I kind of look back now, I realize we didn't necessarily have that verbal positive reinforcement all the time. Totally. Mm -hmm. But there were different types of reinforcement that were present. I mean, I grew up in a family of all doctors and engineers. Like, yeah. all my cousins are doctors. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, I want to be a chef. <laughs> you know what? Well, you're probably the cool one. Like, what are you yeah, doing you with your life? Cool <laughs> you're, you're probably Definitely the cool one. Tina, what does your scroll say? What does real change look like to you, and how can we get there? Oh, uh, OK. Uh, this was sort of like <laughs> directed how much, to how much time you got in this video? <laughs> We're going deep. Tina, get us started. Let's go. Well, you know, so. I mean, real change, obviously, on the work that I'm doing at Time's Up is real change means to have workplaces, right, that are safe, fair, equitable, fully represented. Everybody can reach their full potential. You know, that's the goal, right? That's Then that's how we don't have any more sexual harassment happening because you've got workplace culture that is fully inclusive and respectful. One thing I think we can also do to support change is just being unapologetically ourselves. And that's what any viewer can do at home, right? I think a lot about planning out what the world is gonna be like for my kids. Right. Our children and our children's children, you know, it won't matter so much where they came from, what that family story is. What, what'll matter is that they're a visible minority living in America. And what, what kind of place can I create for them in which they feel like they belong? and making sure that, if, you know, we create a space for ourselves here. And when we talk about the community, one of the things I've always struggled with is we're so divided because we're not united by a single religion mm -hmm. or language or culture. I, was, I kept thinking to myself, what are the things that we can do to bring ourselves together? And there's got to be more than just like, oh, we, we all leave our shoes outside, right? Like, <laughs> there's got to be more than just that. Like, there's got to be more than that. And even though I'm not Japanese, there's this really beautiful Japanese tradition called kintsuki, where you take broken pieces of pottery, and with gold, you basically take disparate parts and put them back together. Please take I'm one pass and one. pass yeah, one. Pass. Pass it down. Here we go. Right, here we go. I am not a stranger to the dark. Hide away, they say, because we don't want your broken parts. I've learned Shame of all my scars. Run away, they say. No one will love you as you are. But I won't let them break me down to dust. Kintsugi, it's a symbol of what we did tonight coming together to support one another, all in solidarity. When I sharp his words, want to cut me down, I'm gonna send the flag. This dinner was just such a great representation of different perspectives coming together and celebrating, first and foremost, who we are as individuals. And that it's not just how our histories or being Asian informs us, it's what we're doing to inform what it is to be AAPI, right? So I think that that is the power every viewer at home watching can take with them. This is me. Look out, Gazira. Look out.
So what's so great about this is that we're not only showing visibility in front of the camera, or even at a table full of people with recognizable names, right? Even here behind the camera crewing, we have so much AAPI representation. And if people could see behind the scenes on this wonderful project, uh, I would say like at least two thirds of the people who came up to me today are of Asian descent, which is awesome. You don't always see that on crew. Many Asian women are working here, which is always my favorite thing to see. And I know that I felt a lot of people nodding in the crew. Yeah, <laughs> even the white guys were nodding. And I felt, <laughs> I felt the power of that, yeah. This is just something that, again, you don't have to see just happening on camera in one special video. Take this to your homes. Make this part of your own daily conversation and together we can make change. Mm. Eugene Ooh. Liang for Office, go, baby. 2024, yeah. that's right, okay. Yeah. <laughs>